I came to a worn, musty cot in Calamity's shack. Velvet Remedy was lying on the floor, panting and soaked in sweat. Calamity himself stood towering over me, shadowed from the light coming through the window over the workbench around him. What happened, little Pip? Where? I blinked, looking around. What? You made it all the way up, Clemity asserted. I saw you do it. But we were most of the way up when you screamed, thrashing like you were on fire, and flung yourself from the porch. I fell? My eyes went wide. I turned, looking around. The door to the shack was open. I blinked as the image of the black book swam in front of me. Much like having turned away from staring at a bright light and seeing the shape of the light dance before your eyes. But nothing in a visited memory had ever left such an imprint outside of the experience. I blinked, clearing my vision. I could see the porch where I was lying, had been lying. The memory orb was nowhere in sight. Darn tootin' you fell, Clamity retorted. We had a hell of a time getting you up here, even after you went limp. Been worried sick. What the hell happened? I... I looked towards the empty porch again. My instinct was to lie. But there wasn't a lie that wouldn't end up worrying my friends needlessly. I made a mistake. While I was waiting, I touched a memory orb. It... Only it was damaged. You did what? Calamity snapped. On the porch? Lil Pip, I barely caught you. I cringed back, staring at my Pegasus friend, my hooves pushing at the cloth on his cot as my back fumbled sloppily against the wall. You know, it's hard enough to carry one pony. I can't do it with two when the second one is bucking and screaming like she's been eaten from the inside out. Calamity lashed out. Unpleasant nightmares about Paris Brights watched through my mind. You nearly brought us all down. Velvet Remedy had to use her magic to catch you. And now I remind you that she ain't nearly as good with spells as you are. I turned a nervous look to Velvet. She was so exhausted that she could barely return my gaze. And don't you think, after all she's been through last night, that maybe she doesn't deserve for you to make us all scared to death that you're dying from something in the smoke. Oh, goddess. The weight of what I thoughtlessly had done to them crushed down on me. I started to shake. The hurt from my shame and Calamity's righteous anger broke the floodgates. And suddenly, the emotional dulge from the last week consumed me. The horrors of Philadelphia, slavery, the pit, the threat to homage, the slaughter of Stable 2. My mother. I'm sorry! I yelled back, bursting into tears. I fucked up! It was horrible! I... I'm sorry! God dang it, little pip! Clementy growled back angrily. Your curiosity is gonna get you killed one of these days. And today, you nearly took us all with you. I'm sorry! Clementy snorted, glaring as I broke into sobs. Velvet Remedy trembled huffing as she got to her feet and moved closer to me, pulling herself onto the cot with painful effort. Okay, Clampity insisted. Ground rules. From now on, you don't play with one of those things unless you're on the ground, out of combat, somewhere safe, and you have one of us watching over you. Having laid the law, Clampity allowed his expression to soften, his own utter exhaustion finally showing through his eyes. He gently wrapped me with a wing. The two of them stayed with me until the tempest passed. Now buck up, little pip, Clemente finally said, prodding me with his wing. You gonna have a look at that floor safe, or not? I nodded, although for the first time, I really didn't feel right allowing my curiosity to be sated. I slid down from the cot and looked at the floor beneath it. It was, at most, an average lock. Even in my distress, I could open it easily, with or without tools. 
the safe clicked open. Amongst the saddlebags worth of decaying personal effects, one item sat gleaming and unblemished by time. A statuette of Rainbow Dash. Her pose was powerful, wings spread, and a huge grin on her face. Go ahead, Calamity said softly. Take it. I know you collect those things. But don't you want it? I asked, surprised. I already got her cutie mark burned into my flanks, and she already was close enough to me. I nodded, then carefully reached out with my magic, experiencing a sudden surge as my magic touched the silhouette. Statuette. I was better. I felt like I could be better than I had been before. Do anything. Nimbler. More graceful. But more than that, I was, in a word, cooler. The inscription from what Rainbow Dash's inscription had to be. Be awesome. Calamity stepped out of his shack and into the oddly reddish-orange air. He was encased in the terrifying black carapace of his old enclave armor. The tips of his four Nova Surge rifles glistening wickedly. He tested his wings and the scorpion tail. Then he lowered his head and hoofed off the helmet. He looked back up, letting the smocky wind catch his orange mane. He looked weird without his hat on. Forget it, he huffed with a stomp. I'm not going around like this. He turned and trotted back into the shack. I'd rather be shot. It took him less than a minute to shuck the armor. Velvet Remedy wrapped it in her magic, making sure to also collect his helmet from the porch. Well, at least take it with us. You may change your mind whenever when you see whatever forces Red Eye has around Ten Pony Tower. Fine, he grumbled. I've grabbed everything I want. Let's just go. I paused. Calamity? I know you were hoping to sell a bunch of those slaver weapons up at Ten Pony, but I really think we should give them to Ditsy Do. You know, as a thank you for what she did for Stable 2. Velvet Remedy Nade. That would be a rather impersonal gift, Little Pip, and possibly a painful one, considering what slavers had done to her. I frowned, wincing. Besides, if you really want to give New Appaloosa more weapons right now, I had to admit that I did not. Instead, Velvet Remedy looked to Calamity. Do you know anything that Ditsy Do likes? I agree with Little Pip. We do need to give her a gift. Something that shows our thanks for help. Well, Calamity thought, she likes muffins. Velvet looked shocked. Ghouls can eat? Apparently. But they didn't have to. But they could. I smiled. Between Homage and Zenith, we had the best cooks in the equestrian wasteland. I spent most of the ride trying not to think about anything that had happened recently. I knew that if I did, I'd start crying again. Instead, I tried to focus on the discussions between the outcasts, but they delved into internal Steel Ranger politics, and I felt my attention drifting. That strawberry lemonade sat next to me, chiming into the others' conversations at every opportunity. Strawberry lemonade, I thought, sounds delicious. I groaned, catching myself before my imagination went too far south. I needed homage. I looked over the side of the passenger wagon. Twilight was spreading across the wasteland as we approached Fetlock. Below, I spotted the mostly collapsed ruins of that first cottage. But the wandering merchant and his merchant, a mechanical owl, had moved on. As we approached Fetlock, I spotted the faint column of smoke rising up from the pony hole that led to Stable 29, more curled up from nearby drainage gates. There was no sounds of fighting. This is either very good, Steelhoofs commented, or very bad. As we drew closer, a Steel Ranger moved out of the shadows. 
There was a flash of light. I ducked, expecting impact. But it hadn't been a weapon. It was a flare. Bank Applejack. I thought I heard Steel Hooves mutter. It was good news. I let out a breath. It was about time the equestrian wasteland threw us a break. Our luck continued to hold as we glided through the night over Manhattan ruins. As we approached the top of Ten Pony Tower, I could see the firelights from Red Eye's camps below, ringing the tower on the ground and lighting up the Celestia line. They had taken the exterior of the Four Star Station. Griffins flew in patterns around the tower, but they flew low, looking for targets on the ground. I realized, with a start, that Red Eye didn't know about the Sky Bandit. He knew we had a Pegasus, so he could suspect we had faster transport but he had allowed for the possibility that we were walking. If that was true, we'd barely be making Manhattan now if we traveled here, straight from Philadelphia. We had time. We had a problem. There was an olicorn perched on the roof of Ten Pony Tower. Her shield was down, all the better to spot incoming little pips. I could shoot her. The silent zebra rifle would more than do the trick. But the moment she went down, every olicorn in the area would know and there was a good chance Red Eye would too. The passenger wagon lur lurched hard. Ah, crap! Calamity grunted as it began to sink out of the sky. The spark batteries were drained, and our poor Pegasus was too exhausted to handle the sudden change in weight. He nearly fainted from the strain. We began to plummet. Frantically, I concentrated on wrapping the Sky Bandit with my magic. If I could pull myself through the air, maybe I could slow or even reverse our fall. My horn flared blightly. The strain hit me with a shock, buckling my legs, reminding me that I hadn't slept in over a day. We were still falling. I pushed harder, my body trembling. A, a layer of overglow burst from my horn. Sparks started to shoot from its tips. The glow around the sky bandit became a brilliant light, and it attracted the attention of one of the griffins below as we plummeted towards the patrol line. The Riven turned toward us, lifting her sniper rifle, and fired. Now, everyone would know we are here, but I can't focus on that. I was pouring everything I had into trying to slow our descent. A second overglow wrapped around my horn. Beams of light shot out of it. We began to slow. Ah, hell, Calamity moaned weakly, but all collapsed in the harness as the Alicorn took off from the roof, diving towards us as she held up her shield. I screamed, somehow tapping into strength I didn't have. Be strong. Be unwavering. Be awesome. A third layer of overglow erupted from my horn. The Sky Bandit stopped abruptly, hovering in air. Then, we began to ascend. The Alicorn's eyes widened, and she stopped her descent. Her horn began to cackle, with electrical energy, as she prepared to cast a bolt of lightning at us. The griffin shot ahead. This time, the bullet hit the wagon, leaving a small hole in the roof. The griffin began to reload, and was engulfed in a green flame. Pyrelight hooted happily, and swept back after us. Velvet Remedy had tossed her shield around the Sky Bandit, and the first bolt of lightning struck it, and the shield imploded, but it kept us from being hit. Part of my mind realized that the shock of the strike would obliterate my concentration and we would fall to our deaths. The Yolicorn was flying upwards, back towards the roof, keeping a distance between herself and us as her horn crackled again with electricity. Pyrolite landed next to Velvet Remedy, looking proud. Zenith had shattered another flask on the floor and was stomping in it. As the second bolt lashed out, the zebra grabbed my mane in her teeth and pulled me onto her back. The powerful electric bolt hit the Sky Bandit, arcing all the way through the metal flame. frame. Velvet let out a lady-like squeal and collapsed. Pyrolite squawked and tumbled to the floor of the passenger wagon. Zenith and I remained unharmed, protected by her insulating potion. We continued to rise. There was nothing else we could do. The Alicorn landed on the edge of the roof. Motes of magic began to form a ring around her, forming into... Eldritch darts. From somewhere on the rooftop, 
a lashing beam of cosmic energy struck the Alicorn, rippling the shield where it pushed through to strike the monster directly. The shield imploded as the Alicorn was reduced to luminescent, moon-colored ash. I floated the sky bandit onto the rooftop. Homage was waiting for us there, the alien weapon floating by her side. As soon as she saw me, she galloped to the passenger wagon and wrapped me in a big hug. Homage. I could smell her, feel her soft coat and the warmth of her body. My own relaxed in her embrace, and once more, I began to cry. A zebra! Homage squeaked happily. Zenith cringed back as Homage offered a hoof. She doesn't like to be touched, I told the sexy gray unicorn. Homage lowered her hoof and nodded. And who might you be? Zenith asked, prompting introductions. Inspiration hit me. Homage, would you allow... I paused. Could you ask DJ Pwn3 if Zenith could spend some time in the MAS EBS? Homage and Zenith both looked at me cautiously and curiously. Please? I asked Homage. I, I'm sure it can be arranged, Homage said trustingly. I turned to my zebra friend. DJ Pwn3 has cameras all over the equestrian wasteland. Maybe one of them has seen your daughter or her tribe. The zebra's eyes widened. I saw a glimmer of hope. Homage smiled. Yes, please. And I'm sure I can get DJ Pwn3 to let you peek at some of the archived footage to show you how to do so, and I'll leave you in private. She blushed a little. Little Pip and I are going to be busy, but we won't be far away. She likes spankings and bondage, Velvet told Homage in a conspiratorial, loyalty <clears throat> overly loud whisper. I stared at her, eyes wide, blushing hotly. That's not true! Homage raised an eyebrow. Did you two talk about liking spankings and bondage? She asked innocently. No, I mean, yes, but... Oh, Homage said, feigning understanding. So, you talked about Velvet liking bondage? No, me, but... Ah, oh, crap. So you do like it? Homage was grinning way too much. I gave up, hanging my head and accepting my doomedness. I narrowed my eyes, whispering to the charcoal-coated mayor. All those times I fantasized about you? That was before I learned you were evil. Don't worry, Homage said, wrapping a foreleg around me as she smiled, her eyes twinkling as she glanced to Velvet. Last time I learned you were multi-orgasmic. Tonight, I'm going to find out just how many you can take before you pass out. She nibbled one of my ears. Then, I'm going to find out if I can wake you up with one. So, some bondage might be required. I felt myself flooding with heat and embarrassment. I simultaneously wanted to both let her tie me up and do whatever she desired, and to run away and hide under a rock forever. I stayed, feeling faint and nearly falling over. Delicately, Homage maneuvered me towards the rooftop door. Wow, Zenith said, standing with the others as we walked away, her exotic voice gaining a touch of melancholy. With all your teasing, I was beginning to feel sorry for the little one. Now, I feel a little jealous. Yes, Valdremdi agreed, sounding a touch stunned. So do I, she turned to Calamity. No offense. Offense? Hell! I feel jealous. Homage snickered, then turned to the others. Are you coming? I stopped, at first thinking she was inviting them to watch. That I couldn't possibly know, but Homage had less cruel plans. I've arranged for you to rest and have the same suite as before. It's all taken care of. 